The Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 1, Canada's Residential Schools, The History, Part 1, Origins to 1939. Between 1867 and 2000, the Canadian government sent over 100,000 Aboriginal children to residential schools across the country. Government officials and missionaries agreed that in order to civilize and Christianize Aboriginal children, it was necessary to separate them from their parents and their home communities. For children, life in these schools was lonely and alien. Discipline was harsh and daily life was highly regimented. Aboriginal languages and cultures were denigrated and suppressed. Education and technical training too often gave way to the drudgery of doing the chores necessary to make the schools self-sustaining. Child neglect was institutionalized, and the lack of supervision created situations where students were prey to sexual and physical abusers. Legal action by the school's former students led to the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada in 2008. The product of over six years of research, the Commission's final report outlines the history and legacy of the schools and charts a pathway towards reconciliation. Canada's Residential Schools, The History, Part 1, Origins to 1939, places Canada's residential school system in the historical context of European campaigns to colonize and convert Indigenous people throughout the world. In post-Confederation Canada, the government adopted what amounted to a policy of cultural genocide, suppressing languages and spiritual practices, disrupting traditional economies, and imposing new forms of government. Residential schooling quickly became a central element in this policy. The destructive intent of the schools was combated, compounded by chronic underfunding and ongoing conflict between the federal government and the church missionary societies that had been given responsibility for their day-to-day -day operation. A failure of leadership and resources meant that the schools failed to control the tuberculosis crisis that prevailed for much of this period. Alarmed by high death rates, Aboriginal parents often refused to send their children to the schools, leading the government to adopt coercive attendance regulations. While parents became subject to ever more punitive rules, the government did little to regulate discipline, diet, fire safety, or sanitation at the schools. By the period's end, the government was presiding over nationwide fire traps that had no clear educational goals and were economically dependent on the unpaid labor of underfed and awfully sickly children. McGill Queen's Native and Northern Series, McGill Queen's University Press, www.mqup.ca. The ISBN number for this book is 978-0-7735-4650-9. Let's start. Canada's Residential Schools, Volume 1, Part 1. McGill Queen's Native and Northern Series, in memory of Bruce G. Trigger, Asar Carter, and Arthur J. Ray, editors. Our ice is vanishing. Sick of it. Nangulituk. I'm not sure how to say that. A history of Inuit. Newcomers and Climate Change by Shelley Wright. Maps and Memes Redrawing Culture, Place, and Identity in Indigenous communications, Communities. Gwenlim Lucas Eads Encounters, An Anthropological History of Southeastern Labrador. John C. Kennedy. Keeping Promises, The Royal Proclamation of 1763, Aboriginal Rights and Treaties in Canada. Edited by Terry Fang and Jim Aldridge. Together We Survive, Ethnographic Intuitions, Friendships and Conversations, edited by John S. Long and Jennifer S. H. Brown, Canada's Residential Schools, A History Part 1, Origins to 1939, The Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 1. Canada's Residential Schools, The History Part 2, 1939 to 2000, the Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 1. Canada's Residential Schools, The Inuit and Northern Experience, The Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 2. 
Canada's Residential Schools and Métis Experience, the Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 3. Canada's Residential Schools, Missing Children and Unmarked Burials, the Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 4. Canada's Residential Schools, The Legacy, the Final Report of the Truth and Com Reconciliation Com Commission of Canada, Volume 5. Canada's Residential Schools, Reconciliation, the Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 6. Aboriginal Rights Claims and the Making and Remaking of History, Arthur J. Ray. Abenaki Daring, Daring The Life and Writings of Noel Ann Annance. 1792 to 1869, John Barman. For a complete series list, please visit www.mqup.ca. Canada's Residential Schools, The History, Part 1, Origins to 1939. The Final Report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Volume 1. Contents. Statement from the Chair, Justice Murray Sinclair. Statement from the Commissioner, Dr. Marie Wilson. Statement from the Commissioner, Chief Wilton Littlechild. Introduction. Section 1. The Historical Context for Canada's Residential Schools. 1. Colonialism in the Age of Empire. 2. The Churches and Their Mission of Conversion. 3. Residential Schooling in French Canada, 1608-1763. 4. Treaty Making and Betrayal, the root, Roots of Canada's Aboriginal Policy. 5. Pre-Confederation Residential Schools. 6. Mission Schools in the Canadian West, 1820-1880. 7. Confederation Colonization and Resistance. 8. National and International Model for Canada's Residential Schools. Section 2. The Canadian Residential School System, 1867-1939. 9. Laying the groundwork for the residential school system. 10. Student accounts of residential school life, 1867 to 1939. 11. Establishing and operating the system, 1867 to 1939. 12. The struggle over enrollment, 1867 to 1939. 13. The educational record of residential schools, 1867 to 1939. 14, The Student as Laborer, 1867 to 1939. Recreation and Sports, 1867 to 1939. The Daily, Deadly Toll of Infectious Diseases, 1867 to 1939. 17, Building and Maintaining the Schools, 1867 to 1939. 18. Fire, a deadly hazard. 1867 to 1939. 19. Food and diet at residential schools. 1967 to 1939. 20. School clothing. 1867 to 1939. 21. Discipline. 1867 to 1939. 22. Covering up sexual abuse. 1867 to 1939. 23. Student Victimization of Students, 1867-1939. 24. Truancy, 1867-1939. 25. Separating Children from Parents, 1867-1939. 26. Suppressing Aboriginal Languages, 1867-1939. 27. Separating Children from Their Traditions, 1867-1939. 28. Separating the Sexes, Arranging Marriages, Establishing Colonies, 1867-1939. to 1939. 29. The Lytton School, 1902-1939. to 1939. 30. Parents Respond and Resist, 1867-1939. to 1939. 31. The Staff Experience, 1867-1939. to 1939. Notes. Bibliography and Index. A statement from the Chair, Justice Murray Sinclair. The residential school system established for Canada's Indigenous population in the 19th century 
established for Canada's indigenous population in the 19th century, is one of the darkest, most troubling chapters in our nation's history. While some people regard the schools established under that system as centers of education, they were in reality centers of cultural indoctrination. The most alarming aspect of the system was that its targets and its victims were the most vulnerable to society, little children. Removed from their families and home, home communities, seven generations of Aboriginal children were denied their identity through the systematic and concerted effort to extinguish their culture, language, and spirit. The, school, the schools were part of a larger effort by Canadian authorities to force Indigenous peoples to assimilate by the outlawing of sacred ceremonies and important traditions. It is clear that residential schools were a key component of the Canadian government policy of cultural genocide. That any Indigenous person survived the culturally crushing experience of the schools is a testament to their resilience and to the determination of those members of their families and communities who struggled to maintain and pass on to them what remained of their diminishing languages and traditions. As each generation passed through the doorways of the schools, the ability to pass on those languages and traditions was systematically undermined. The schools and Canada's overall treatment of its Indigenous peoples have seriously affected Indigenous pride and self-respect, and have caused individuals and communities to lose their capacity to cope with the daily tasks of living. The evidence of that is seen in the serious social conditions that Canada's Indigenous people face. While children, many children did not survive. Thousands of children died in the schools. Thousands more were injured and traumatized. All were deprived of a measure of dignity and pride. We as a country lost the opportunity to create the nation we could have been. The legacy can be seen in the myths, misunderstandings, and lack of empathy many Canadians openly display about Indigenous people, their history, and their place in society. Canadians have been educated to believe in the inferiority of Indigenous peoples and the superiority of European nations. This history and its aftermath, therefore, should not be seen as an Aboriginal problem. It's a Canadian one. Ultimately, the schools became the focus of number, numerous lawsuits. Thousands of survivors sued for their losses and mistreatment. The legal actions were joined into a massive class action, resulting in the largest legal settlement in Canadian history. The settlement agreement called for the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Despite many challenges, the Commission and the groups supporting us worked tirelessly to uncover and face the difficult truths of Canada's residential school system and its tragic legacy still felt today by survivors, those close to them, and in communities from coast to coast to coast. Starting in 2008, we collected millions of documents, visited more than 300 communities, and heard testimony from thousands of witnesses. We heard of the effects of over 100 years of mistreatment of more than 150 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children placed in these schools. The survivors showed great courage, conviction, and trust in sharing their stories, which collected here are now part of a permanent historical record, never to be forgotten or ignored. The next chapter in this history, which begins with this report, is reconciliation. Reconciliation will not be easy, and it will take time, but to make it happen, we must believe it should happen. Without a deliberate and thoughtful will for reconciliation, the sustained action that manifests that will in meaningful, measurable change, we will not achieve the task the survivors have given all the people in Canada to repair the damage done to the relationship that was promised as far back as the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Reconciliation also is not an Aboriginal problem. It is about creating a relationship of mutual respect that was promised in the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and in the assurances given and reflected in the many treaties signed between the Crown and Canada's Aboriginal people, since most since Confederation. All people in Canada, including newcomers, have a role in this relationship-building process. While we may not all share a past, con past connected to the residential schools, we share a future. We must all call for an ongoing process of re reconciliation, regardless of political affiliation, cultural black background, or personal history. We must all accept the challenge of enacting effective solutions to the disproportionate cycles of violence, abuse, and poverty experienced by Aboriginal people. 
we must strive to become a society that champions human rights, truth, and tolerance by confronting, not avoiding, the history recounted in the following pages. To achieve this, we must bear witness to the past and join in the vision for the future. Our calls to action, therefore, should not be viewed as a national penance, but as a second chance at establishing a relationship of equals. This final report marks not the, the close, but the beginning of a journey towards a more just, fairer, and more courageous country. We all have the opportunity to show leadership, courage, and conviction in helping to heal the wounds of the past. What we do now and in the years ahead matters not only for us today, but also for the generations to come and the spirit of those who are no longer with us. The words of truth and expressions of apology are vitally important, but there is still much work to do on the journey ahead. During the course of our work as a commission, we encountered thousands of Canadians who saw the wrongdoings of the past as an opportunity to do good for the future. Dozens of honorary witnesses joined us in listening to the stories of the survivors and committed themselves to continue to bear witness into the future. The members of our survivors committee stood by our side as we went about this work, advising and supporting as we, us as we listened. Cultural and health supports strove tirelessly to ensure we all worked in a safe and positive environment. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude. My colleagues, Commissioner Chief Wilton Littlechild and Commissioner Dr. Marie Wilson, and I have approached this work as a sacred trust. Our families have supported us in every step of this very difficult journey. Our children and grandchildren have been our driving force and our daily reminder of the importance of what we do. I dedicate my work on this commission to my wife, Anamikakwai, possibly, my children, Miss Godag Aginkwai, Nigonwedum. Again, I don't know how to say these words and these names, and I apologize for that. Bin Dige Jis Higo Kwai, Kise Witze Kwai, and Gis Heg Wenabik, and my grandchildren, Nimijian. New Bens, Misko, Venetia, and Megensens. Please correct me because those are wrong. Because of our families, we as commissioners are committed to make this a better country. For the sake of ours, I hope you will join us. Justice Murray Sinclair, Mizana, Guy Zihik, Chair, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Statement from the Commissioner, Dr. Marie Wilson. When is the job really over? We as Commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, TRC, have repeatedly said over the past six years that the completion of the TRC mandate will just be the beginning of reconciliation after 130 years of imposed church-run residential schools. So much work is needed to repair the self-imposed damages to our country, to Indigenous people, families and communities, and to our founding relationships. We offer a roadmap for the continuing work in our 94 calls to action based on an unprecedented depth of public consultation. 7,000 people spoke up from every region of the country. This has been the heart of our work, giving voice to those before heard or believed, former students, sorry, giving voice to those never before heard or believed. Former students, survivors, bared their souls in remembering what so many had spent lifetimes trying to forget. In doing so, they created a public responsibility to now remember what happened in Canada in the name of education. Decades of children feeling alone, silenced, too often hungry, cold, sick, afraid, abused, ashamed, angry. Little ones feeling forsaken, abandoned, unloved. Thousands who did not survive. The anguish of parents left behind. Such courageous voices unveil shame on the presumptions of superiority, transplanted government, and superimposed religion of my ancestors. Yet resilient voices have also lifted up, proclaiming the right to be happy, reclaiming personal names over numbers, battling addictions, and learning self-care, receiving, as failed parents, the gift of first-time words from their children, I love you and I forgive you. Spiritual ceremonies, formerly outlawed by Canada, have been welcoming to all, with an offering 
that there is no wrong way to pray. Prominent Canadians from all sectors have pledged themselves to ongoing reconciliation as TRC honorary witnesses. We can never unknow what has been revealed. Canadian laws created residential schools. It belongs to all, including newcomers, to, to do something about the better understood consequences today. I hope that we have learned I hope what we have learned will be widely heard, respected, taught, and perpetually commemorated, lest we forget. I hope that patience, compassion, and skilled care will support those still in the midst of gut-wrenching healing journeys, that school-threatened languages revive, and that Indigenous and publicly elected leaders begin to meet regularly in normalized spaces for collaborative decision-making, respecting sacred covenants, and binding treaties. I hope that we acknowledge the two real, the real two solitudes of Canada today, the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and devote ourselves to closing the glaring educational, economic, and sociopolitical gaps between them. May Canada be enriched in national wisdom and international reputation by the rebalancing of a shared country. And may we come to be known as a country that learns from past failings, that feels outrage at pre president justices, that acts for what is still possible, and that believes in the power of truth and reconciliation to transform everything, a life, a relationship, a country. It is a sacred job barely begun. With infinite love to Stephen, Kyla, Daylin, Keenan, Maslin, Tidze, Sidia, and Ryden, this work is for you and all the children of Canada. Some of those names I said wrong. Dr. Marie Wilson, Commissioner. A statement from the Commissioner, Chief Wilton Littlechild. When you work for our community, you must do everything you can to make it better than pass it on to the next one. These were my late grandfathers, Chief Dan Mind, Mind's words to me in Cree as a 12-year-old. I was and had been a residential school student for six years already. The true meaning of this instruction really took on full significance for me during these past six years. Thank you to my fellow commissioners, Justice Mary Sinclair, Dr. Mary Marie Wilson, and all those who helped me focus our work as a sacred trust. What a blessing it has been. We have listened very carefully to many courageous individuals in our search for the truth. Through pain, tears, joy, and sometimes anger, they informed us about what happened. My gratitude and adver admiration for your strength and resilience to those who shared your views on how we can and how we must work together very hard for reconciliation going forward. The encouraging advice from one of my schoolmates was, it starts with me. I need to make things right with our creator, the Great Spirit. The one reoccurring message for me throughout the public hearing was the necessity of the essential step of returning to spirituality through our languages, cultures, and land. We have all been guided in our journey by the seven universal gifts, sacred teachings towards having good relations or better relationships with mutual respect. In the many different ways, we gathered stories in a safe setting. Thank you to those who provided medical, cultural, and spiritual support. Also to the many who prayed for us throughout the years. Hi, hi. Thank you. While there are many significant highlights for me, four solutions for making things better stand out. I believe treaties are a solution. They are a basis for the strength and partnerships that call on us to work together. I believe that the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a global consensus, offers us a true framework for reconciliation. I believe the greatest opportunity for positive change is lifelong le learning, holistic education. I also believe these are best achievable if we work very, very hard on unity. We, know, we now know from many survivors' testimonies that in building on the strengths of our people, the power is in family. Reconciliation will come through concrete action on these priorities. Finally, let me conclude by extending the best I learned from fellow survivors to my own and extended family for their sacrifice, patience, and being here for me. Helen, Megan, Neil, Teddy, and my grandchildren. Shana, Cleveland, Summer, Keyshawn, Nea, Jack, Ava, Jalen, and Connor. The seven most powerful words, I'm sorry, I love you, thank you. Chief Wilton, Little Child, Commissioner. Canada's Residential Schools, Volume 1, Part 1. Introduction. 
For over a century, the central goals of Canada's original policy was to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide. Physical genocide is the mass killing of the members of a targeted group, and biological genocide is the destruction of the group's reproductive capacity. Cultural genocide is the destruction of those structures and practices that allow the group to continue as a group. States that engage in cultural genocide set out to destroy the political and social institutions of the targeted group. Land is seized and populations are forcibly transferred and their movement is restricted. Languages are banned. Spiritual leaders are persecuted. Spiritual practices are forbidden and objects of spiritual value are confiscated and destroyed. And most significantly, Secondly, to the issue at hand, families are disrupted to prevent the transmission of cultural values and identity from one generation to the next. In its dealing with Aboriginal people, Canada did, Canada did all these things. Canada asserted control over Aboriginal land. In some locations, Canada negotiated treaties with First Nations. In others, the land was simply occupied or, pied or seized. The negotiations of treaties, while seemingly honourable and legal, was often marked by fraud and coercion, and Canada was and remains slow to implement their provisions and intent. I will read all of the footnotes later because they are on page 800 and I don't want to flip back and forth. On occasion, Canada forced First Nations to relocate their reserves from agriculturally viable, valuable or research-rich land into, onto remote and economically marginal reserves. Without legal authority or foundation, in the 1880s, Canada Institute a, instituted a past system that was intended to confine First Nation peoples to their reserves. Canada replaced existing forms of Aboriginal government with relatively powerless band councillors, councils, whose decisions it could override and whose leaders it could dispose, depose, excuse me. In the process, it disempowered Aboriginal women. Canada denied the right to participate fully in fully in Canadian political, economic, and social life to those Aboriginal people who refused to abandon their Aboriginal identity. Canada outlawed Aboriginal spiritual practices, jailed Aboriginal spiritual leaders, and compensated sacred objects. And Canada separated children from their parents, sending them to residential schools. This was done not to educate them, but primarily to break their, le their link to their culture and identity. These measures were part of a coherent policy to eliminate Aboriginal people as distinct people and to assimilate them into the Canadian mainstream against their will. I am going to stop now simply because I am very, very drippy. I have a cold right now. I will start on this page four tomorrow. Thank you.